I would go over and look at the boxes of anonymous photographs. And I, I started developing some themes. The photographer's shadow, if there were quilts in it, men together, the same with an anonymous quilt. Who was this maker? What was her life like? In the anonymous photographs were, who are these people? You're listening to Seamside, where we explore the inner work of textiles. I'm your host, Zach Foster, and today we sit down with quilt advocate Roderick Kierkoff. Now, before we jump into this conversation, just a quick word of thanks to the good folks over at the Quilty Nook. Seamside just wouldn't be possible without your ongoing support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It's no secret that I love a good tiny quilt. They're portable, you can usually finish them in one sitting, and they make really meaningful gifts for your loved ones. So that's why I am happy, happy, happy to share with you this brand new upgraded revised video tutorial about how to make a tiny quilt. It's wonderful for anybody who wants to learn more about hand sewing. I show you a few of the techniques that I use the most, and I would love to share this with you. I'll put a link in the show notes below if you would like a half hour video, just you, me, sitting, and sewing. Now, Roderick Kirikoff, I believe, has to be one part human and one part guardian angel. He's been a huge support, both of me and many other quilters out there, generously lending his experience and insight that can only come from the decades he spent as an advocate for quilts. On a recent trip to New York City, he and I caught up at Tatter's Blue Library to immerse ourselves in Brooklyn's beautiful textile research space and all of its attendant shades of blue. We cozy up on a big blue couch in the corner of the library for this conversation, and we had to pass the mic back and forth, so you may notice a scuffle or two from time to time. But to me, it just adds to the intimacy of the conversation you're about to hear. In this conversation, we talk about first quilt encounters, and y'all, the degree to which Roderick can remember details of a quilt that he saw over 50 years ago is truly touching. We also talk about how quilts can help us connect with ourselves and others around us, and what anonymous quilts and anonymous photographs have in common. I hope you enjoy How to Hold Quilts Loosely with my friend and quilt advocate, Roderick Kierkoff. Roderick, thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you, Zach. We are sitting on a super comfy sectional sofa in various shades of blue. Very comfortable. <laughs> yeah. And we are squirreled away in one of Brooklyn's gyms. We are at Tatter the Blue Library. And for folks that haven't seen this on Instagram, Roderick, could you describe where we're sitting right now? What do you see? I see the most beautiful shade of blue. Everything is painted from the floor to the ceiling. Bookshelves, all blue, filled with all kinds of textile books. And then the most darling, sweet objects of sewing, spools of thread. A lot of it's blue, <laughs> but I love when a bookshelf has books and just adorable, sweet objects. And this has it. This has it. Yeah. And even the couch that we're sitting on, each section is upholstered in a different blue fabric. So it feels like we're sitting on a giant indigo quilt. I know. I know. And I totally want this couch. <laughs> it's so comfortable. And some of it looks like it's woven. Some of it, the cushions look like they are quilted. And it's just incredibly comfortable. Well, before you and I started recording, we were chatting with Jordana, the director of Tatter, who said... I mean, you were here. She said, anything I want, just tell her. So, Jordana, I want this couch. Well, when I came to the front door, she was, just, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're here. Which is always, it touches me that I'm held in that high regard. Well, you have books here, Roderick. I do. There are books of mine on the shelves. And we're going through the books that she doesn't have, which I'll donate to the library, which I'm happy to do. So it seems fitting to me in a library such as this that we talk about one of your books. And we'll get to that in a second because we have it sitting on the couch beside us. But first, Roderick, I was doing my homework this morning and I was listening to a recent interview you gave with Brandy on Quilter on Fire. And in that conversation, which is a wonderful kind of overview of your life and career with quilts, I would recommend anybody that wants to know more about 
Roderick's life. Go listen to that one because we're not going to dive into that. We're just cuddling up here on this couch and we're just going to talk about quilts and books and see what happens. Um, and I realized I did go into detail. On that. Oh, but you've got great stories. Thank you. Thank you. One, though, there, there was a moment early on in the conversation where I'm like, when I talk to Roderick this afternoon, I'm not going to let him slip by this detail because you began to mention that uh, you found your first quilt. You collected your first quilt in Los Angeles, of all places, in 1973. Is that correct? I saw my first quilt. I did not buy it. It was on the bed that I was sleeping with with my girlfriend. It was a quilt that her aunt had made. It was from Wisconsin. It was a butterfly quilt, very 30s, 40s, pastel. I think the butterfly antenna were hand-embroidered. It just, it was a sweet, adorable quilt, and it reminded me of my grandmother, who was a seamstress. And I grew up sitting in her sewing room watching her use her sewing machine, her Singer sewing machine. And at first it was a foot powered, then she got it electrified. So it just always was I connect that with my grandmother. And she was patching clothes and jeans and I started wearing cutoff jeans, which shorts, that was the fad of that day. Please let me hem up your short. <laughs> Please let me. No, 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 no. You don't understand. These are, it's a whole look, Grandma. It's a whole look, Grandma. <laughs> and then it was the next year in L.A. I went back to college. I was in Pasadena. An instructor had on her wall a log cabin, a silk log cabin, quilt top, unfinished, Black, but lots of colors, deep, rich, beautiful. She had it hanging on her wall as a piece of art. And again, that was this kind of light bulb that went off in my head, like, oh my gosh, it looks incredible on the wall. Besides a bed, that's another place that quilts can be and be appreciated. So those were the two moments in Los Angeles, away from the Midwest where I grew up, that planted what now have turned out to be deep seeds. <laughs> Very deep seeds. I brought a quilt and I haven't even shown you yet. Can I show it to you? Please, please. Okay. So you might have seen this quilt on Instagram. Probably did. did I do did. follow you, <laughs> you regularly did. on you Instagram. Did. So this is the beach shirt quilt, Roderick. I, I was walking down the beach with a friend of mine about a month ago. And I found this shirt washed up on the beach. This is the shirt. Oh my god. And it's only about half the shirt, right? Like it's it's maybe one of the arms, half of the front panel on the back. What color do you think it originally was? I think because... it was this kind of sand colored. Okay. That's my guess. But there are these kind of dark patches and there's rusty patches. Yeah, it's it's very modeled color-wise. I would have never have guessed that it was a shirt, but here is a pocket and then some wonderful patches and rough edges <laughs> well it was just so i love a raw edge to me when i'm looking at a raw edge quilt yeah it pulls double duty one it reminds me of like the items i grew up with in the 80s that are like right. this country decor i often think of a, a piece of embroidery in my partner's grandma's kitchen that says dust is a country accent Oh, that's great. So when I think about raw edges, I think yeah. of dust as a country accent and yeah. that whole milieu, if you will, right? So I love raw edges for that, but on an aesthetic level, it also just feels like it blends better, right? It's more painterly, to use the word. And I really appreciate just how it leaves the edges natural. Just Well, the then it reminds me of my tattered jean shorts, <laughs> <laughs> the rough edges and the strings hanging down. Um, then there are wonderful places where there are holes yeah. in it that show lets the beautiful blue fabric that's underneath come through. And there's even this one encrustation <laughs> with a she she with a seashell sticking out of it. It looks like a barnacle. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. Oh, this is great. Yeah. So we'll look and at this more together. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask where it has a lot of blue yeah. fabrics, uh, blue prints. Where did those come from? Well, I didn't set out to make a quilt that felt like a map, but it does read that way. Like this feels, the shirt feels often like an island to people. 
and there's as we open it up a little bit more and see more of it. Yes, it yes. Like yes, so. yes. So it does feel cartolog- cartographic, cartological. Feels like a map. Yes, it does feel like a map. <laughs> <Word> <laughs> it. But honestly, I didn't pick blue for the for water. I wasn't trying to make it feel like a map. I was just wanting a color that made this shirt really shine, and I think I did. Yeah, it does. It truly, truly does. Thank you for sharing that. It's a beauty. Now we're in a library. There are quilts and textile objects, but there are also books, and there's a particular book sitting right beside you. And it's called Unconventional and Unexpected. What? How, how did I ever pick that one off the shelf? Out of all these books, you went and found your own. What's funny to me about this is that I got one of the first edition copies. Love this book. Love this book. I can flip through it over and over. Fast forward a few years. I'm in Chicago at Amanda Nadig's house. And I need a book to weigh down a quilt because I'm hand quilting on a table, you know, and I like a little weight like Heidi Parks does. And so I was like, Amanda, where are your big books? And she points me over to the bookshelf. And I just grab yours. But it turns out it's not the first edition. It's the second edition. And when I pull it off the shelf, it, I almost drop it because it's significantly heavier. It weighs almost five pounds. And when I got my first copy of the second edition, I was amazed. I go, this is a very weighty tome. <laughs> People have referred to my books as that, but this indeed, the weight of it, I loved it. Um, so this book, how many years was it between the first and second editions? The first edition was 2014, I think. I'll double check the colophon. Let's see. Yes, I'm right. 2014. <laughs> it went out of print. I was pretty surprised. So I contact the publishing house to, I need more books. And I'm told, oh, well, let me check with the warehouse. Warehouse, oh, it's empty. I go, well, when it's going to be reprinted, I'll, we'll get back to you, was the response that I got. And I was devastated. I really, really was. Because I knew there was still an audience. There were people saying, I want this book. Where can we get it? It was on Amazon at one point. Somebody was selling it for $700. Now, they were offering it that. I don't think people were paying, but I mean, that's exciting to see, but I wasn't going to get any of that money and no one else was going to buy it at that price. So I had the idea of going to Quilt Folk because I loved what that magazine was doing. And I've shared it with Mary Fonz and Mike McCormick, the publisher, it really reminded me of the Quilt Digest, but taken to a totally new level. And, and they've said, yeah, Quilt Digest was an inspiration for them. And so I came to them and said, might you be interested in reprinting it? And they weren't publishing books then. It was just the magazine. And so long story short, they were thrilled. They wanted to do it. We did it. We expanded it wonderful forward in the second edition by Carolyn Maslumi, and they printed it on heavier paper stock. And my hope is that it can stay in print for a long, long time, but just having it out there in the world and seeing the effect that it has had on lots of people, it's very, very rewarding to me. Any thoughts on a third edition? No, <laughs> although there are quilts that still were not published in the second edition. Books are a lot of work and I'm getting older. I'm retired, although busier than ever. But whether I've got another book in me, I'm not sure. I'm happy to give people ideas for books and see them take them forward. But it's an interesting time, too, where... On some level, books don't have as much weight or interest for people, but yet here we are sitting in this beautiful library with all of these wonderful books, and there's still many, many people that want to have a book in their lap, holding it in their hands. It's just a different experience than experiencing it at, online. Well, a book comes curated, right? right. It's, right. It, c- it comes with a certain authority mm-hmm. that when you're sluicing through hundreds of search results online, 
you don't know what you're getting. But when you pick up a book, you feel like you are reaching out to someone who's a trusted source. Yeah, yeah. And just the the way a book is put together, I find very appealing. It's satisfying to have beautiful design, to have beautiful writing, to work with people who are great writers, work with great photographers. It is very much a collaborative event. And then I've been very, very fortunate to work with publishers that want to produce beautiful books. One of the things you mentioned about this book that surprised you was that there was a certain part that never got as much attention as you thought it might. And I see you have the book open to that page. I do. It's the last chapter in the book. And the title is, This Picture is Not a Family Heirloom, written by Abner Nolan, who is an artist and an educator. And it it was a nod to, it's, we were talking earlier, I do collect other things besides quilts. I am a collector at heart. I've always loved photography. And so whenever I had a little extra money and fine art photography at that time was not as expensive as it was, but I still would be buying photographs from dealers over time. But it really allowed me to just explore that interest. And so I formed a pretty good collection of photography over the years. But I also was interested whenever we went to antique stores or flea markets or for whatever, looking for quilts, I would go over and look at the boxes of anonymous photographs and always with an eye of like, are there any photographs with quilts in them? And they're very, very rare. The other interest I had was photographs of men and men together and just how were men portrayed or two men together portrayed in photographs, but the same with, it was with an anonymous quilt. Who was this maker? What was her life like? What was she thinking as she made it? How was this quilt used or not used in the anonymous photographs where, who are these people? Rarely was there any information on the back of who they were. Were these, if they were two men together, were they friends? Were they brothers? Were they cousins? Depends on who asks. Or were they partnered in some way? Did you ever find a photograph of two men in a quilt? No, but I have seen some photographs since. So as I was buying quilts online, when I did decide to like, okay, I am going to start looking for quilts that just appeal to my eye, I'm not trying to do a historical overview or anything like that. I was curious about quilts made primarily in the last half of the 20th century. And for decades, people had said, oh my gosh, you just have a great eye. I was so flattered when Cuesta Benberry, the incredible quilt historian, told me once, there are two people in the quilt world that have great eyes, and you're one of them. <laughs> and I just, I was so flattered. I was curious to say, who's the other one? I was going to ask. I didn't, I didn't say, but I just, for her to say that to me was just such an honor. But even just last night, reading an article about an artist, a musician, who was very successful who have imposter syndrome. It's just so common <laughs> among us all. Like, oh no, no, I'm not that good. I don't have a good eye. I'm not that talented. My quilts aren't that great. Whatever the art is. But with this search for quilts, I decided I'm just going to trust my eye, buy what I like, what interests me. And I specifically was looking for the quilts that were not perfectly made, that, quote, mistakes, which usually are never mistakes, pieced lots of printed fabric, the kinds of quilts that would be rejected for a quilt show or they were being juried in, just all kinds of, kind of the quirkier, the better, the more printed fabrics put ne right next to each other, the better. And Michael and I had bought those kinds of quilts when we were dealers. And I really credit a couple who were antique dealers in Indiana. And I'm just 
it's Fenerville. I just remember the name. Centerville, Indiana. They had an incredible gallery in an old, old stone building, but you walked inside and I felt like I'm in a gallery in New York or in Los Angeles. Beautiful walls, big high ceilings. And they had an eye for the quirky quilt, not perfectly made. Um, there was not a big audience among private collectors then, but we personally liked them. We would buy them. And then we discovered the outlet for those at that time. And this would have been late 70s and in the early 80s were corporate art buyers. Bonnie Earl Solari was one of those at Bank of America in San Francisco. And it really was fun to show them these quilts. And, and she and others bought beautiful traditional quilts, but the quirky, the funky, they responded to those as well. And they saw them as works of art. Keep going. <laughs> That's good. I, I was, I was letting you take a beat if you wanted one. <laughs> okay. Well, so I'm starting to buy quilts. I was finding quilts online. It was fun to see a little picture of something and then have it come in a box and open it up and put it on the studio wall and stand back from it and just be blown away by it. I, I mean, I never knew like, is it going to be good or is it not? But for the most part, 99% of the time, they were way better than I ever expected. But being the collector, then I let myself start looking at anonymous photographs. And there were a lot of dealers that were selling anonymous photographs. And again, I looked, I, I started developing some themes with those. The photographer shadow was one. If there were quilts in it, I was getting those. I also looked again more for men together. So I started forming this another little collection that got to be quite large of these anonymous photographs that, again, I just, I dearly loved. And just to be a little unconventional and unexpected when this book actually came together, I wanted to include that. And it's a Polaroid color photograph of a quilt hanging on a clothesline in, I think, Southern California, because there are palm trees in the background. It's a flag quilt. I'd love to know where that quilt is. I would love to own it. But I just, again, I wanted to include that in this book and was thrilled, as I said, when Abner agreed to write an essay around that photograph. And the photograph really is remarkable because looking at it now with you, it is on the clothesline, but you don't really see the clothesline. No, so it's like no. the quilt is just taut and suspended in midair Correct. and you have yes. a really strong shadow of the quilt on the yes. ground yes it's i mean the dark shadow almost looks like it's a hole in the ground for a coffin <laughs> and yeah it's just it's just elevated itself <laughs> over the over the ground there's a big utility pole way in the background isn't that that yeah yeah <laughs> And then it's, I love the palm trees. I spent quite a few years in Southern California. There just were so many things about it that resonated with me, even if that wasn't necessarily a quilt on the line. It's just a beautifully composed photograph. The dark shadows on the right and the left, and there's a wall behind it that kind of goes just a little above the halfway. So if we're dissecting this as a piece of art, I think it's just beautiful. So yeah, it really is wild, isn't it? So if you have a copy of Roderick's book, make sure you look on page 215. You can find the picture that we're talking about. In the first edition, I forget what page it is. It's still the last essay of the book. But yes, in the first edition, it's on page 215. I got a couple more questions okay. for you. And then, ooh, we got 15 minutes. Roderick and I have hot dates tonight. We're going out. <laughs> We're meeting our partners for dinner. So we got 15 minutes, folks. We got to wrap this up. Question number one. What are you excited about over the horizon? Ooh, that's a good question. 
Well, one of the things that's on the horizon for me is I've just accepted to be on the board of the International Quilt Museum. I'm looking forward to that, excited. I've enjoyed my involvement with the museum already over the years, but it will be fun to sit on the board and maybe have a little more say in what happens. <laughs> I guess I'll explore more of the patchwork fashion that I've seemed to have started wearing. I got to say, I was fully expecting you to be in your quilt coat here at Tatter today, and I was disappointed to see you were wearing the same boring puff coat I was. <laughs> I can't like do it all the time. I don't want to be totally Mr. Quilt, but it has been fun. Initially, I thought, I'm not going there. I can't do that. I can't just be patchwork, 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 morning, noon, and night. And why not? Because I have other interests. I don't feel like I'm just one thing, but it definitely, it's having a big moment. And I think more than a moment of men wearing patchwork clothing. Emily Bodie certainly was a big part of that when she started her men's line based a lot on quilts and quilt tops. It's amazing to me the number of comments that I get when I do wear them out in public. And a lot of it does come from other men who say, that coat's really rad. Or those jeans that Michelle- cut off? <laughs> no, no, I'm not wearing cutoffs. But Michelle Muska in Connecticut asked me a number of years ago, would I send her a pair of jeans that she wanted to put patches on and patchwork? And I'd said, don't hold back, go for it. And those are great to wear. And again, it's like, it's, it's generally, it's often men that comment on, God, those are really good. Or the term that I love, or those are dope. <laughs> then, And they're like, where can I buy a pair? And you're like, Oh, but I give them Michelle's name and, and I do love promoting the people who are doing this. Sunny Smith, one of the, another author in Unconventional and Unexpected, she wrote the essay, Quilts Are Quilts. I was showing them quilt tops. Was Sunny Smith also recently in the People's Quilting Bee with Tatter? She was, yes. Just the most recent one. It's been a wonderful relationship having met her many years ago, but as I have given away quilt tops to artists and quilt makers who, whose work I really like, who want to use them or not. And they said, I would like one. <laughs> I said, I had no idea you would. Come on over. So at the Quilt Barn in San Francisco, we just had a fun afternoon looking through tops, all kinds of tops. Opened this one in particular that I'd always liked. Without any hesitation, they said, you have to make this into a suit. And anytime, anything that Sonny <laughs> recommends, I do. I don't question. And so there wasn't enough fabric in it to make a full suit. I think possibly a full suit would have been a little too much. But I found a wonderful tailor in Oakland who made the jacket. And then I asked Michelle again to add pieces of the quilt top that were left over to put them on a pair of jeans to that coordinated the whole look without being too much. And it's, I see it as promotion. Without a doubt. And I, I happen to know that of the many things you and I have in common, we are also both Enneagram nines. And I was just reading about the homework for Enneagram nines recently. And one of them is get dressed up in your finest finery and walk around because it puts the nine who is usually more comfortable kind of like receding a little bit. It forces us to the foreground, which is what I imagine a quilt coat does when you're in public. That's really interesting. I didn't know that aspect about the nine, but it makes perfect sense to me. And I totally experienced that. My first reaction is I don't want to call attention to myself. Some of that was had to do with age. I began to realize, you know what? I can do anything I want to now. <laughs> Let that old guy <laughs> just do what he wants and not be concerned about what will people think of me. And it is empowering. It has been empowering to me to 
put on this, I'll borrow it from Dolly Parton, coat of many colors, walk down the street and own it. And for a nine, that's a big thing to own yourself, to own your your power, your beauty, your talent. Um, so that that has been a big piece of wearing this kind of clothing. I believe it. I believe it. We just recently had a workshop on the Nook about the Enneagram and the kinds of conversations that opened up for people because of the way it provides kind of a framework and language for thinking about how we move through the world. That's just incredible. That's incredible. And even though I've read about the Enneagram for years, I came out of that two hour session with even more insight than I had going into it. So it was really helpful. That's great. I would like to close with the question I ask everybody okay. that comes on the show, and that is, and feel free to take a moment to think about it. How do quilts make us more human? How do quilts put us in touch with ourselves? What is, another way to think about it is, what is the inner work of quilts? Well, the thing that comes to me is the duality or more than duality that quilts have because I first came to them as from a comfort level, certainly from beauty, that for the most part, women made them. They were a way of expressing for that woman her artistic, her womanhood of making and taking care of a family, keeping them warm and comfortable. And at the same time, they can be beautiful objects on a wall, but yet they still possess that other quality about them. And particularly with this most recent collection of quilts, it was clear to me that many of them that came to me had been slept under, had been used on beds, and just the spirit, all that they possess inside of them. And then the ways that people relate to them. So many people have a history of some sort with quilts. A grandmother made them, a mother made them, or they grew up with quilts on their beds. They took quilts to college. And I've just, I've heard so many wonderful stories And that's how I would answer that question. Well, it makes me think, too, of what Heidi says. She's she's come to visit me in New York a number of times. And she says when she gets in the taxi cab, the the driver will often want to talk her up a little bit. She says, if I'm in the mood to talk, I tell him I'm a quilter. Mm -hmm. If I'm not in the mood to talk, I tell him I'm a textile artist. And the conversation's (laughs) over. (laughs) But everyone really does have some tangential connection right. with quilts. I, I will tell in the in story. Soon after an article came out in the New York Times about Emily Bodie and came to New York, Jack and I came, went to her shop on a second floor in Chinatown and just looking at quilts and quilt tops and talking about what she was making. And <laughs> she asked us the question, what kind of quilts do you sleep under? And at that point... I still had not slept under. I did have an early, early moment way back in the 70s. But until just recently, it's like, I don't want to have quilts everywhere. (laughs) I don't need to sleep under. But that was a seed that was planted. And Jack and I started sleeping, picking out quilts to sleep under. And some of them are contemporary quilts that gotten from young makers it's fun. It's, it's, it was just an interesting question to be asked and realize, oh, I don't. And then to change that. She threw you a curveball. She did. Would you like to describe for us the quilt that's on your bed right now? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some things have got to be sacred in this world. Right, I understand right, it. <laughs> right. Well, Roderick, thank you so much for taking time out of your visit to New York to chat with me here at Tatter. Thank you, Zach. It's always great to get together with you and catch up. Let's go eat. All right. That's good. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Roderick as much as I did. Remember, I would love to share with you that video tutorial I made. Just sign up at the link in the notes below. And until then, 
I hope you're up to something good. I hope you're sewing something good. And I hope to see you soon, maybe around the nook. Who knows?